Okay, so thank you so very much for coming out tonight. My name is Stephen McCann. I'm the deputy editor of Slugger Tool, and we're hosting this event tonight in partnership uh, with the School of Applied Social and Policy Sciences here at Ulster University. And we are delighted with the guest speaker that we have tonight, uh, Dr. Nicholas White, who is the senior director at APCO Worldwide um, and has numerous decades of experience in uh, political, uh, <laughs> more than one, um, in international affairs, advocacy and research. Um, he has a, a great depth of knowledge and understanding about the Brexit process. And most recently, he was recognized in 2017 and in 2018 as one of the top 40 online EU influencers on Twitter. We're an online website, so we care about that uh, sort of stuff. So, so Dr. White is also a, um, a, a visiting professor here at Ulster University. So without further ado, uh, to speak about Brexit, we have Dr. Nicholas White. Thank, thank you very much, David. Can everybody hear me okay, by the way? Just to, I will try and be, be clear. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic to be back. Um, I, as, as some of you know, I fled from Northern Ireland as a political exile in 1996 after standing in the elections in May that year, so almost 23 years ago. I won't say which party because I think there should be a statute of limitations on political activity in that way. But um, I do want to thank the 95.7% um, the of the North Belfast electorate who voted for somebody else instead of me. And indeed, I think there's a couple of you in the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I've, as, as David said, I've, I've been in Brussels for 20 years working in think tanks and more recently with uh, APCO Worldwide, which is a consultancy. Um, I, I have been accused of opposing Brexit because I personally am benefiting from the European Union. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, in a piece that, uh, that uh, the newsletter ran, thank you, um, just before the referendum, I predicted that Brexit would be a bonanza for public affairs consultants like me. Um, the process will involve lots of moving parts. Uh, the end result will be more decisions taken in London, where lobbying is, is, not even, is, is hardly scrutinised at all, rather than in Brussels, where the demands of transparency are getting tougher and tougher. My prediction was right. Brexit has taken me to give lectures in Istanbul, Rome, Portland, Oregon, Nashville, Tennessee, and now York Street. Thank you. Um, and uh, this doesn't actually make me very happy. Um, uh, Belfast is increasingly visible in Brussels. Last night I went to an event in the Belgian Comics Museum. It was an award ceremony for creators writing comics about European issues. One of the entries was by a, an artist born in Belfast, now living in Dublin. A very nice story about a gay couple driving across the border and reflecting on how life has changed for the better in the last few decades. And I'm very glad to say that that story actually won. But on my way there, it was brought painfully, literally painfully, home to me just how closely the English language has penetrated Brussels. I was zooming across the, the park on one of these hired scooters. I don't know if you have them here, Lime scooters. Um, and I misjudged, misjudged a curb and fell off it, and uh, ripping my trousers open. And a passerby called out to me in English, are you all right? Not in French or in Flemish. And perhaps he just felt that anyone who fell off a scooter must be a native English speaker. <laughs> uh, maybe I just looked like one. I, I thought I looked like a Pratt. Maybe it's the same thing. Um, anyway, all of this to say I am, of course, a true believer, but out of sentiment and conviction rather than out of uh, personal gain. And I thought it would be useful to outline here how Brexit has been seen in Brussels with some reflections on this part of the world. Um, and a, a lot of, we're, we're blessed with many commentators on the process. I've drawn my analysis largely from Politico, which is the, the, the main Brussels newspaper these days, uh, but also the journalism of Peter Foster and Tony Connolly, also the periodic analyses of um, Andrew Duff, Peter Ludlow, Sir Ivan Rogers, um, and, uh, and general gossip. But I think it's interesting that the process has, has um, I don't draw any conclusions from it, but the process has actually been, been led most recently by women. On the EU side, Angela Merkel is by far the most important decision maker, maker on Brexit as she is on everything else. When she eventually leaves the scene, she will be replaced by another woman. Um, Michel Barnier's deputy, Sabina Veyant, is, uh, is widely seen as the, she certainly speaks better English, so she's quite often wheeled out to give presentations. Um, and on this side, of course, it's, uh, it's Theresa May. And uh, where it's not Theresa May, it seems to be Yvette Cooper in league with, uh, in league with Oliver Lethwin. So a lot of my story is about British politics. But before I go there, it's, it's interesting how little the EU has been reflecting about the extent to which 
it's, it is itself to blame for Brexit. Um, there's a great new book, and I mean really new, published last week by Luke von Middelaar, Dutch political scientist who was uh, Herman von Rompuy's uh, speechwriter. And he makes the very good point that the EU system was never built to include internal constructive opposition. The EU was deliberately and politically constructed as a peace project, a massive peace project to remove the incentives for future conflict in Europe through economic cooperation. A very senior British official in the EU once said to me, the triumph of Europe is to convert exciting political issues into dull technical ones. Funny definition of triumph, but there you go. The EU works by consensus, expertise, technocracy, grand coalitions. Even though almost all decisions by member states are theoretically taken by qualified majority vote, in fact, there are very few votes. There's a very strong incentive to find a consensus that everybody can, can buy into. The same is true in the European Parliament, where unlike in a national parliament, there's no group of members that represents a potential alternate government. It's therefore very difficult to explain to voters how their vote for one candidate or party rather than another at a European Parliament election is going to change the way you live. It's not very surprising that protest parties and protest candidates tend to do much better in European elections than at any other level. Um, locally, some of you, myself included, are old enough to remember that Ian Paisley stunned everyone except his own supporters when he got almost 30% in the first European Parliament election here in 1979. It's worth noting that apart from European elections, the DUP never exceeded that threshold until the last Westminster election in 2017. Tomorrow, of course, is another day, though I don't think tomorrow will be that day that it goes, goes higher. What the EU does is often rather complex and difficult to explain as well. A friend of mine used to be the foreign minister of one of the Balkan countries, and I asked him once how his negotiations with the EU were going. And he said, I can't do the accent, so imagine, imagine Balkan accent. He said, you know what the difference is between the Mafia and the European Union? I said, no. He said, the Mafia makes you an offer you cannot refuse. The EU makes you an offer you cannot understand. <laughs> He's not alone in his frustration. Um, I personally find that the Brussels bureaucracy is, is actually quite easy to penetrate if there's a topic you really want to talk about. The officials who are dealing with particular issues are often just really glad to have a, a, a reasonable, interesting conversation with somebody who is actually interested in their day job. But it's easy for me, I admit, to find these officials because it's my job to find them and I appreciate it looks very different from outside the European quarter. So I admit that the EU looks like it is, its grand coalition decision-making can look like it's stifling debate. And we've seen a backlash against this in other countries. We've seen the Greek government's uh, efforts to reject the bailout terms in 2015. We've seen the Hungarian government's opposition to EU refugee policy. We've seen the, Italian, the current Italian government's opposition to pretty much everything. Um, but so far, this has only led to a decision to leave in one country, the UK. And why is that? And preparing this talk today, I tried to think of when it was that Brexit became inevitable. Personally, I realised it was all over when I watched the debate between Nick Clegg and Nigel Farage in April 2014. I don't know how many of you watched that. There were a whole load of us piled into the Grapevine pub on Place Luxembourg in Brussels, uh, and it was screening the debate on the TV sets that they normally use for football matches. Um, and I was there to cheer for Clegg. Most of the crowd were Lib Dems, there for the same reason. There was very little cheering. Uh, as you will remember if you watched it, Farage wiped the floor with Clegg in that debate. And further reports reached me over the next few months about how badly the Remain campaign was being run. Then there were the UKIP surge and Lib Dem wipeouts in the elections of 2014 and 2015. Um, so when the votes were counted in the referendum, on that morning of June 2016, it came as a shock, but not really as a surprise. But where was the political turning point? Some say 1992, when John Major negotiated the Maastricht Treaty, only to find himself stabbed in the back by Margaret Thatcher and the Eurosceptics. A Conservative but pro-EU friend of mine suggested to me um, yesterday that the key moment is more recently, and he said it was 1997, when Michael Heseltine decided not to run for the Conservative leadership 
uh, leaving the way for William Hague to defeat Kenneth Clark on an overtly Eurosceptic platform. That normalised Euroscepticism as a key policy for one of the two main political parties of the UK. If Heseltine had run, or if just a few more pro-EU Tories had been spared the 1997 Labour Party landslide 22 years ago today, um, there might have been scope for more positive engagement with Europe. With due respect to my Conservative friend, I think he exaggerates the importance of the Conservatives in 1997. And I think I personally would put the turning point about five years later, after Tony Blair won his second election, and he decided not to spend his political capital on fighting and winning a referendum on whether or not to join the Euro, but instead to invade Iraq. And I simplify a little, of course. The main reason he didn't call that referendum was because he was not certain that he could win it. If it had been won, the British would have been on the inside of EU monetary policy, and the Euro itself would have been much less German in the way it operated. There would have been the huge psychological effect within this country of using the Euro in our daily lives. Um, finding that the world does not come to an end just because the Queen is no longer on your banknotes. She would have stayed on the coins. And of course, local banknotes here don't have the Queen on anyway. So I think that's the last policy decision by British Prime Minister that could have ultimately kept the UK in the EU. And I really strongly recommend a, a, an essay by Chris Hewn, the former Lib Dem cabinet minister, a subsequent uh, convicted uh, felon, which develops this, this counterfactual a bit more. Um, it includes the question of how the EU might have collectively handled the 2008 financial crisis better if the UK had been inside rather than outside the Eurozone system. Another critical decision, but this was opposition rather than government, was uh, Cameron's withdrawing the Conservatives from the Euro European People's Party when he was elected Conservative leader in, in 2005. It was a cheap shot that got him votes and cost him nothing. But what it cost him was that the internationally minded members of the Conservative Party were now no longer rubbing up regularly against like-minded politicians from other crucial EU countries, notably Angela Merkel's Christian Democrats and Fine Gael. It may not be crucial in itself, but it confirms the trajectory towards departure. But I think we also have to keep in mind the relentless campaign against Europe run by the British media over many years. I exclude local media. Um, this was also cheap. It sold newspapers. The EU could never respond quickly enough, even to outright falsehoods. And anyway, as they say, if you're explaining, you're losing. Alistair Campbell gave a very good summary of some of the most blatant lies in the British media in his evidence to the Leveson inquiry in 2011. And I'll quote it because it's a, it's a good summary. He said, several of, our, several of our national daily titles, The Sun, The Express, The Star, The Mail, The Telegraph in particular, are broadly anti-European. At various times, readers of these and other newspapers may have read that Europe, or Brussels, or the EU superstate, has banned, or is intending to ban, kilts, <coughs> curries, mushy peas, paper rounds, carefully cheese, charity shops, bulldogs, bent sausages and cucumbers, the British Army, lollipop ladies, British loaves, British made lavatories, the passport crest, lorry drivers who wear glasses and many more. In addition, if the Eurosceptic press is to be believed, Britain is going to be forced to unite a single country with France. Church schools are being forced to hire atheist teachers. Scotch whiskey is being classified as an inflammable liquid. British soldiers must take orders in French. The price of chips is being raised by Brussels. Europe is insisting on one-size-fits-all condoms. New laws are being proposed on how to climb a ladder. It will be a criminal offence to criticise Europe. Number 10 must fly the European flag. And finally, Europe is brainwashing our children with pro-European propaganda. Lord Leveson, in his report, refers to this passage and says that Alistair Campbell must have been exaggerating, but he was not. Um, there is a view that another crucial moment was the EU's handling of the 2008 financial crisis, including the apparent removal of elected Greek and Italian governments from power, and the austerity inflicted on, for instance, Ireland and Greece and Cyprus by the Eurozone. I respect the opinions of those who think that. All I can say is that enthusiasm for the EU remains strong in all of those countries, despite the wrongs that the British media report is having been inflicted on them, largely because they have a better understanding of their own local circumstances and what the causes of their, of their problems really were. To read the British press, you would think that the euro had been an unmitigated disaster, 
I'll just point out that four of the current 19 Eurozone countries actually joined it after the 2008 crisis, an increase in membership of more than 25%, which doesn't look very disastrous to me. From the Brussels perspective, everybody could read British newspapers, but the British diplomats and officials that we would meet, and most of the British MEPs, all seemed actually quite sensible and committed to fighting Britain's corner, but finding common ground within the EU. So a lot of people were lulled into a false sense of security. One key moment that wasn't taken seriously enough at the time, although I did write about it myself, um, was the December 2011 EU summit, where the Eurozone member states were trying to establish a banking union to make future bailouts easier to handle. Um, Sir Ivan Rogers has written many good things about all of this, but one of his, one of his best pieces is, is an early lecture um, given November last year, I think, uh, maybe even the year before, at Hartford College, Oxford, um, reporting on the development of the British referendum policy when he was uh, first the, the, the key EU advisor in the British cabinet and then Britain, Britain's ambassador in Brussels. Um, as he tells it, David Cameron had legitimate concerns that Eurozone members would gang up together to make fiscal decisions which suited them more than the UK. Cameron turned up at the summit with a list of demands which were intended to protect the status of the City of London as the EU's main financial centre. British diplomacy around this was colossally mismanaged. Leaders who had come to discuss an immediate crisis and the setting up of the banking mechanism were not impressed by the British suddenly demanding attention for a much more long-term and local issue. When Cameron vetoed the agreement, the other member states simply went ahead without him, apart from a couple of much smaller non-Euro countries. This meant that for the first time, the EU was making an important st structural innovation, not just without the UK participating, but without the UK even agreeing to it. It was in retrospect the first institutional step towards creating the EU27. Um, Sir Ivan blames the EU for not giving Cameron's requests a fair wind, and for, he, and for having fiendishly thought ahead in advance about how to get around a British veto. Um, I'm not sure that they should be blamed for thinking ahead, but there we are. This brings us to the 2015 election and Cameron's pledge of an in-out referendum on EU membership if he won it and if he got satisfaction from the EU in negotiating new terms. The Brussels view of the referendum pledge is that this was a cynical short-term move by Cameron to keep his party together, whatever the cost and that he was also overconfident because he'd won the Scottish independence referendum in 2014. I don't completely buy this. I remember that even the Lib Dems were in favour of a referendum back in the days when they thought they would win it. It wasn't the first referendum that had happened on this issue. My own earliest political memory is the 1975 referendum, which is really weird considering when and where I grew up. Um, and Cameron had real concerns about the fiscal situation and also about the concept of ever closer union. So it's too facile to write, off, to write off the referendum as purely a party manoeuvre. So quite a lot of time and effort was put into the negotiations with the UK in late 2015, early 2016. And this was a point when Greece was again in trouble and the migration crisis was hitting the headlines. And Cameron actually got most of what he wanted on the technocratic stuff. He got an exemption from ever closer union. He ensured that the Eurozone could not gang up on the UK as, as he had feared. And he even brought in a new role for national parliaments to block new regulations that were, uh, that were seen as undesirable. What he didn't get was anything very much on migration. I guess if we're looking for turning points, one of the others might have been Tony Blair's decision to open immigration to the, all of the new member states after they joined in 2004 on the 1st of May, again, exactly 15 years ago today. The number of new arrivals was considerably greater than had been expected. This was because the British economy needed workers and the arrivals rather liked it once they got here and word spread. Migration, unfortunately, became pop part of the populist narrative. Migrants were blamed for the squeeze in public services, actually caused by austerity, and for the lack of housing in parts of England, actually caused by the failure of successive governments to have a, a, real, a realistic housing policy. The EU was prepared to allow the, the UK second-class membership in exemption from ever closer union and the provisions on money and finance, but it stood, for, stood firm on the four freedoms of the single market. 
Cameron's initial position that the UK should be able to set quotas for internal EU migration was firmly rejected by the rest of the EU. And he settled instead for provisions allowing the UK to cut EU migrants out of the benefits system. It was pretty weak stuff. Even so, it went too far for, so for some on the EU side. Uh, John Bruton, the former Taoiseach, <coughs> criticised the deal at the time. President Macron, who was not yet president at that point, has said that it went too far. And not surprisingly, it didn't sell well. The argument had been lost on migration years before and on Europe possibly years before that. Against the, tides, against the tide of decades of negativity about Europe, mostly based on false reporting, and in the context of the social damage done by austerity. I think it's remarkable that the Remain vote managed as much as 48%, with nothing much to put up against the powerful slogan of taking back control. I'm not going to go on about Cambridge Analytica and the £350 million in the bus, uh, um, and that's obviously paid a factor as well. My role here today is to talk about the, the EU view. The EU as a whole reacted really quickly, with Donald Tusk sending agreed lines to take to all EU leaders at 7.22am on the morning after the vote, before Cameron had even resigned. By the next Tuesday, the EU had agreed a coordinated response, they regretted the outcome, they would handle Brexit according to the treaties, the EU would negotiate as a bloc, there would be no negotiation without the UK's notification of its intent to withdraw, and they hoped that the UK would remain a close partner after Brexit. The UK's political capital was fairly low at this point. Cameron's resignation did not help. What helped even less was the appointment of Boris Johnson as Foreign Secretary and David Davis as Brexit Secretary. I see she's lost another minister this evening, by the way. Um, the Johnson appointment in particular was very damaging to Britain's credibility. He was and is seen as a figure of utter unseriousness, dishonest and opportunistic, given to describing the EU as Nazis and advocating that Britain could have its cake and eat it. I have noted already a couple of points where I disagree with the mainstream Brussels narrative. This is not one of them. Throughout the nine months of phony negotiations, until the Article 50 notification was given in March 2017, the EU speculated feverishly on what the UK's desired Brexit end state actually was and how it should then react. The, the Prime Minister's first big speech at the Conservative Conference in October 2016 famously included the unwise jibe at citizens of nowhere, but it also made clear that she wanted to completely remove the UK from the European Court of Justice. For the EU, this has a very simple consequence. If you're not in the ECJ's jurisdiction, you cannot be in the single market. A week later, I was at a conference where Donald Tusk spoke in response. It was one of his most effective speeches, and I should say it came at the end of a long day, which had started with a particularly poor speech by Jean-Claude Juncker. Um, Tusk said, we all remember the promises which accumulated in the demand, which he meant cum culminated, uh, to take back control, namely the liberation from Euro European jurisdiction, a no to the freedom of movement or further contributions to the EU budget. This approach has definitive consequences, both for the position of the UK government and for the whole process of negotiations. Regardless of magic spells, this means a de facto will to radically loosen relations with the EU, something that goes by the name of hard Brexit. This scenario will, in the first case, be painful for Britons. In fact, the words uttered by one of the leading campaigners for Brexit and proponents of the cake philosophy was pure illusion, that one can have the EU cake and eat it too. To all who believe in it, I propose a simple experiment. Buy a cake, eat it, and see if it is still there on the plate. <laughs> the brutal truth is that Brexit will be a loss for all of us. There will be no cakes on the table for anyone. There will only be salt and vinegar. Donald Tusk was not the only person thinking hard about the consequences and realising that the UK was heading potentially for a very sharp break with the EU. The government in Dublin had been braced for a negative result from the moment that the referendum was called. Tony Connolly has chronicled this in some detail, and I'm sure it's fresh in everybody's memories here. The fundamental problem is that if the UK really is taking back control, what does that mean for the border? It's one of the most impressive achievements ever of Irish diplomacy that both Enda Kenny and Leo Varadkar managed to persuade the EU27 to take a local Irish issue which British negotiators had, had hoped that they could fudge and make clarity on it a vital negotiating point for the whole of the EU. 
And it's interesting here to notice some dogs that did not bark. Spain has grumbled from time to time about Gibraltar, but basically having asked for and got a veto on future EU relations with the ROC has been satisfied with it. Cyprus has been bought off even more easily by arrangements for the sovereign base areas. Um, Michael Howard's threat of military action against Spain did not really impress anyone who has looked at a map recently. I would point out also that in, in the case of what we used to call a cliff-edge Brexit and we now call no-deal scenario, Belgium stands to lose as much in trade as any country other than Ireland, actually more by some calculations. There's been no hint of Belgium dis disrupting the EU line over this. And, there's a, and again, there's a good paper by Alexander Matelaar about why not. The, the other dog that barked in a direction that the British did not expect was Germany. Brexiters famously predicted that German industry would force Chancellor Merkel to offer the UK good trade terms for the sake of continued sales of German cars here. Considering how little attention the Brexiters were paying to British industry, it's weird that they thought that German industry would have that effect on the Chancellor. When David Davis went to Germany and lectured industrialists about putting politics ahead of prosperity, he was openly laughed at at the conference. German industry made its strategic choice decades ago, and it is for European integration. It can be no coincidence that trade talks between the EU and India, with its growing market for luxury cars, warmed up just as Brexit was getting underway. We now move past Theresa May's Lancaster House speech in 2017 um, to the notification to, the, to leave in March of that year. The EU responded that it would love to talk about future trade relations as long as the Irish border and the money situation and the rights of citizens had been nailed down first. And so the negotiations began. Or they would have begun if Theresa May had not then called a general election for June 2017. This move was met with incomprehension in Brussels and elsewhere. Time was already trickling away. The, the UK was going to leave the EU with or without a deal on March the 29th of this year. Remember that? The election meant that another two months were going to be wasted. And it was this point that someone who thought it would make Martin Selmayr, um, Juncker's chief of staff, look good, leaked a blistering account of a dinner between Juncker and Theresa May, in the course of which it became clear that they had very different concepts of how the EU and UK could be linked post-Brexit. May was furious, but it was important information at this stage that the UK really didn't have a clear and feasible plan. The result of the election rather vindicated the sceptical reaction of the rest of the EU to calling it. It did mean I got a lot of calls from people asking me to explain who the DUP actually were. <laughs> Negotiations then began, and uh, there can be few more symbolic pictures than that wonderful shot of Barnier and his team with large dossiers in front of them, and David Davis and his team sitting across the table from them empty-handed. Davis almost immediately agreed to the EU sequencing, withdrawal agreement first, then future relationship, despite having avowed that this would be the row of the summer. Davis was jovial enough as, as, a, as an interlocutor. He never seemed to be quite on top of his brief, and more than once he had to withdraw unhelpful comments that he had made. Um, two different senior Conservatives complained to me that he was simply lazy, and if they were saying that to me, God knows what they were saying internally. After the... Uh, the uh, um, agreement, uh, sorry, the, after it became clear what the, the problem was with the negotiations, Michel Barnier simply took control in December of 2017. And everything that the EU has done since has been based on his, his famous steps diagram, um, which I, you, you will not be able to see it, but this is, this is what it looks like. Some of you will be familiar with it. Um, basically, it goes through the relationship that the EU has with other countries and going through the red lines of why Britain is not going to fit into any of them. First red line, no European Court of Justice jurisdiction, no free movement, no financial contribution, regulatory autonomy. Well, that cuts you out from the European economic area. Uh, so it's going to be a more distant relationship than Norway or Iceland or Liechtenstein. Not that many people care about Liechtenstein. Um, then no free movement. That cuts you out from the relationship with uh, Switzerland. Sorry, the equivalent relationship to Switzerland. Um, if you want an independent trade policy, that um, puts you different position from Turkey. So you're basically looking at the sort of relationship that the EU has with Canada or with South Korea, with some extra frills and wrinkles for uh, security cooperation and political, um, uh, and political dialogue. 
this slide of Barnier's was really the, the moment from which the process took its subsequent shape. The British were left in the position of actually negotiating a softer Brexit than the EU was really prepared to offer, which ran rather contrary to the full-blooded rhetoric that you got from some of the Brexiteers. The Brexiteers sincerely believed that the British negotiators were weakening their own position by failing to insist uh, in su with sufficient manliness on the threat of leaving the EU without a deal. This was wrong, of course. The EU had already started taking the threat of a no-deal Brexit very seriously when it became apparent that neither Boris Johnson nor David Davis was, was, was serious about the process. And that was the real meaning of the leaked May Juncker dinner conversation. The question of the Irish border then became the key point. The issue was really one of trust. Both sides agreed that the border should be kept open. The question was how this could be managed. In the short term, it's not a problem because the EU will remain virtually in, the, sorry, the UK will remain virtually in the EU, maybe vice versa, uh, for the duration of the transition to the end of 2020, probably to the end of 2022, in the case of a deal. What after that? Um, the British government grudgingly agreed that faute de mieux, this would mean that Northern Ireland would have to maintain regulatory alignment with the Republic and therefore with the EU. After the inevitable outcry about creating a border down the Irish Sea, the EU moved to allow the whole of the UK to remain aligned in that, in that event. Um, and in the event that there was no trade deal about the future relationship as a whole, and in the event that there was no technical fix available. This incredibly conditional and medium term provision is the backstop and it became the rock on which Theresa May's parliamentary control foundered. To come at this from the EU point of view, a lot of time had been invested in talking to the British, including several special summits, to agree on the withdrawal agreement, which the Prime Minister was then unable to sell to her own Parliament. Um, certainly for myself, I became convinced for the time being that a hard Brexit was the most likely outcome when it became clear in December that the withdrawal agreement was not going to pass the House of Commons. This became the orthodoxy in Brussels in the new year after the, the various failed parliamentary votes. <coughs> I'm no longer so sure. Brussels was taken by surprise, and so was I, by the ability of the House of Commons to prevent the no-deal Brexit via the cooper Letwin mechanism. And this unexpectedly, for the EU, put the ball back in Brussels' court. And since the EU does not want a no-deal outcome either, when Theresa May asked for more time to try and get the deal through the House of Commons, they granted it to her, although not on exactly the terms she had requested. And that's why we are where we are now. We have the extension, um, uh, I think, the, the possibility of not having the European elections, I think, now falls by the wayside, but um, they, they will happen. Uh, there is the possibility that if the uh, withdrawal agreement is ratified in time, then the UK can leave the EU on uh, July the 1st and the new MEPs will not take their seats. Otherwise, we have a continued extension until October the 31st, at which point something must happen. Um, the two paths laid out by Theresa May are either that she does a deal with Labour or that there'll be a coalition of the willing in the House of Commons. Neither of those looks especially likely right now, but I guess it's not impossible that uh, something could happen in the, in the medium term before October. Um, if we get to the 31st of October and the Commons has not passed its withdrawal agreement, the EU will reluctantly grant a further extension to see things through if the UK asks for it, particularly, but not only, if another referendum has been called or if there is another election happening. But make no mistake, the EU just wants this to be over. A future without the UK has been priced into all future calculations about how the EU will work in future. If the UK does actually revoke Article 50, there will be a general sigh of, oh God, they're back. <laughs> And of course, the ECJ has ruled that uh, this is the one thing the EU cannot control. The European Court of Justice has ruled that Article 50 can be revoked unilaterally. So what do we learn from all of this? I think there are three lessons for the UK and one big one for the EU. The three lessons for the UK in this process are, first of all, it might have been smarter to d decide your own negotiating position before starting the negotiations. Now, that's sort of seems to me not a controversial thing to say. This wasn't done. The negotiations began in uh, 2017 and the Chequers 
agreement was not reached by the uh, British Cabinet until July 2018, more than a year later. Um, not a recipe for success. Secondly, it would have been much better to have a more cross-party element to the process. This was a Conservative process from beginning to end. Uh, well, from beginning until last month, I should say. Um, it would have been difficult for Theresa May to work with Jeremy Corbyn on anything for reasons that are pretty obvious. I think that there are plenty in the Labour Party who would have quite liked to help take responsibility for a major decision and to claim that their hand was on the ball. Um, particularly Keir Starmer strikes me as somebody who is, uh, is uh, realistic about the negotiating possibilities on both sides. Thirdly, it might have been better for the British government to take Ireland seriously. Um, which interestingly is a point I see from most progressors, if I can use that term for people who voted leave and now have changed their minds. Um, it's been really striking the extent to which the British have believed what's in their own newspapers. Um, and they, they don't read the French newspapers, they don't read the German newspapers, they don't even read the Irish newspapers which are helpfully <coughs> written in English. Um, and I think a little bit more engagement with the outside world rather than the Westminster bubble could have been a, could have been a, a useful thing to do. <coughs> the big lesson for the EU, as I said earlier, is the need to reconnect with people. And this is a problem, I mean, it's exaggerated in some parts of the, of the media, but it's a genuine problem all over the place. And I'm not sure if the existing structures can really do it. I'm really excited by the Citizens' Assembly concept, which, of course, we've seen employed in the Republic um, over, the, the, over the recent referendums. Um, it's now also being implemented in eastern Belgium. We have a little German-speaking uh, minority in Belgium who have their own self-government, and they've, they've just uh, this month set up a, yeah, last month still, uh, set up a, a new Citizens' Assembly, which will be a deliberative body and will, uh, will, will hopefully bring politics a bit closer to the people. Um, it's also something, actually, that President Macron has been in favour of, um, setting up more citizens' dialogues between, uh, and, and so we had the, the extraordinary um, spectacle of uh, senior French government officials uh, spending five hours on uh, on Discord, not, sorry, not Discord, Twitch, um, earlier th earlier this year. Who here has ever used Twitch? Right. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Or, or by you. <laughs> yeah, I, I confess the only reason I used it was because they, they did a complete rerun of the whole of Doctor Who from beginning to end. Twice. Um, so, anyway... Uh, I, I, the lesson of Brexit is that um, talking to people is a good thing, talking to your own voters is a very good thing, talking to other people's uh, governments and voters and media is also a very good thing, talking to each other is a, a really good thing. Anyway, those are my thoughts on returning home from Brexit land, from Brussels land. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for that. Um, we're going to go to some uh, Q&A um, here to allow you to ask some questions. Nick's given a lot. Uh, Nicholas has given us a, a lot of uh, food for thought here um, in terms of his um, uh, analysis. So any questions to start off with? Anyone want to put Yep, lady at the back there, and then I'll go to yeah, you. Um, you kind of touched on it, but something that's been fascinating me for about three years now, I mean, literally what language are they using? Because that whole thing about connecting, uh, my own background, I'm afraid to say I've actually worked for Boris Johnson because, um, and he, he, you know, yeah, he, he doesn't communicate properly, even in his own native language. But I think you know, the linguist in me fascinate, is fascinated by those meetings where they all conducted in English. And was it the English of, you know, received pronunciation estuary English? And because what I've learned through my international career is you, you don't just speak your own language, you have to filter, you have to... And so when you say things like they didn't have their own negotiation policy, that doesn't surprise me. But when they actually sat down around the table, what, it, what is the language, what is the phraseology of trying to, to negotiate, I suppose? That's, from That's a really good question. Do you, do, you, do you want to take a couple or should I go one by one? I know, go one by I'm one. i go one by one. Um, First of all, you know, on the most trivial level, the language is English, and it's uh, you know, the, the days are long gone that the that, that French was a language that you really, really, really needed in Brussels. I've had one meeting in French in the last two years. 
but your broader point is what words are being used. And the, the fact is that the EU set the terms of the dialogue, set the terminology at a very, very early stage. It's, of course, set in the EU treaty, um, but it meant that the EU, which, of course, very few people in that room were native English speakers on the EU side, not none, but very few. Um, it, it meant that the, the EU could draw on a collective um, definition of the terms of art in the negotiations that was backed up by 60 years of jurisprudence and, and, um, and discourse. One of the other things that's not often realised about Brussels is because it is such a linguistic melting pot, people do have to talk to each other quite a lot. Um, I, I mentioned it in the Grand Coalition effect that although in the European Parliament everybody is entitled to use their own language and most people do, um, once it gets down to actual negotiations between officials, really you want to cut out the translators and do it in English if you possibly can, um, or just occasionally French, but really, really very rarely. And so, uh, and I mean, you know, another example of this actually. Um, Outside the EU, a friend of mine is the, the foreign minister of a francophone African country and he is the lead negotiator between the developing countries and the EU on the, the new EU development policy. And I mean, he's, he grew up speaking French because it's, it's his country's language, actually. Um, and, uh, but all of the negotiating documents are in English, even though the, you know, a large part of the country is concerned are, are French speakers. Um, so that, 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 and of course, again, the terminology is set by the European Union. So uh, the British never even really tried to gain control of the vocabulary, and uh, and they paid a price. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm on the record. Yeah. No, thanks. I'm not asking this out of personal interest. I don't know if, if that's even working. Is it working? Okay. Um, fascinating talk. Uh, as I, I and you've detailed why the European Union had good reason to be um, dismissive of Britain, but I want to ask you about um, failures in the EU. I mean, Timothy Garton Ash, a uh, massively pro-European, brilliant man, is among people, I heard an academic here saying this, all sorts of people who love to say that this isn't even, I've heard, I think he said not even in the top 10 of EU um, priorities, the point being, oh, you know, you think you're so important, Britain, you're not even the top 10. Surely if that is the case, if this isn't even, let's say, in the top three, maybe it's not their top thing, maybe eurozone problems or migration is higher that is a very damning reflection on the eu that for whatever reason it has lost it, um, by one measure its second largest economy 15 percent of its budget blah 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 and i just wondered if any of them are actually well, well is that assessment correct that it's such a low priority i mean I, it depends on the time of day almost whether it's a high priority or not we've had to is it now three or four special summits you know, of, of the top people in the EU getting together to discuss Brexit? And there's been none on any of these other topics recently. So I think Timothy Gordon Ash has a point in that um, th there's not really a debate in the EU anymore about how to handle this. The debate has happened and it, it didn't even take very long. Uh, the withdrawal agreement has been agreed and um, you know, the EU just isn't interested in going back to that. At the same time, you know, it's a political crisis. It is a big deal. Um, everybody will be sorry when Brexit eventually happens. There will be no celebrations on the EU side on that day. Actually, I, I heard a, a great story that um, some bright spark in the Secretariat for the European Parliament had decided, had actually mapped out in detail um, the whole flag lowering ceremony and how they were going to involve the a formal farewell to the British MEPs who basically told them where they could stuff the, the lowered flag. Um, so that, that's not going to happen. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is a priority, but it's not an actionable point anymore, I think is the thing to say. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's been internalised and people have moved on from it. Lady, thank you very much. Um, fascinating talk. Uh, I have to, Jane Morris is my name, and I have to declare an interest. Yes. I wonder if I'm the only one in the room who's a candidate for the European elections here in Northern Ireland. I don't see another one, so I declare my interest. That's uh, what um, I'm doing. And I want to ask you because um, uh, my platform is recognizing that Northern Ireland has been in the eye of the Brexit storm 
ever since the start because there's so much positive support for what's happening in Northern Ireland and has been for many years from my days in the European Commission office here. And there's so much positive support. And I'm thinking that Northern Ireland holds the key to the solution to the Brexit crisis. I have a petition that's been going since the referendum, uh, which now has up to 7,000 signatures, calling for Northern Ireland to stay in the EU as part of the UK. I called it honorary association, but you could call it special recognition. You know, Sinn Féin have called it special status. There's been other names for it. I think DUP use unique status. But this is something that it's nearly what the, ba I mean, when the backstop was offered, it was virtually what I was asking for. But my, I'm calling it the backstop with bells on because I want everything. I want Erasmus. I want the common agricultural policy. I want all the funding. I want all the peace funding, everything. Uh, I, people can say it's my cake and eat it, but I say it's it's our bread and butter and we deserve it. So I'm just wanting to ask you, what do you think of my proposal for this un unusual, but I, by the way, I've, I presented it to Barnier, I presented it to Juncker, and I have had none of them have discouraged me. So nobody said no, but most of them say, May has to ask for it. And I have that's the one person I haven't been able to talk to yet. She's ignoring me for some reason. <laughs> so I'd love to know your opinion on my proposal. Thank, Thank you, you, Jane. You're, you're basically asking me why I haven't signed your petition yet. I yeah. Know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, look, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting dynamic idea. It's something that people need to be talking about. Um, you know, there's a, there is a further conversation to be had about what all of this means for the constitutional future of this place anyway. And that's, uh, that's maybe further than we're going to go. But certainly people in Brussels are increasingly asking me, what is the future of Northern Ireland going to look like? Um, I mean, as, as you know, it, it will take a conservative, sorry, not a conservative, a prime minister, whether conservative or from some other party, to raise this issue formally at the EU level. But I think it's very important to show what the depth of feeling actually is here and for people to be aware of that. It's been particularly striking the interventions um, that has been made in Brussels by the uh, by local industry and business. Um, that's uh, had a very strong impact uh, just to hear directly from those whose businesses are going to be directly affected by, the, um, by a potential no-deal Brexit. It's been also interesting to note that um, I think more German cabinet ministers have been to the border to see what's going on than British cabinet ministers. I may, I may be wrong. I might have lost count after, after, after two. Uh, <laughs> so, look, debate is good. New ideas are good. Please keep pushing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, two questions. A uh, question about English. First of all, about English language. Do you think this will continue that, that English will be a language fragment when Britain through? Because thinking on a the summer there was in Stratford Navan and I couldn't help thinking to myself, is is English going to be resigned to a minor language in Europe? Mm -hmm. uh, the other question is this whole business in Hungary of Victor Urban and the, the mm -hmm. uh, in fact the EPP are they don't seem to be taking strong action again. Is he considered an outsider in Europe in, in a way that Boris Johnson would be? Because some of the things he do, seems to be doing seem to be uh, unpaid overtime for people and things. And they seem, they seem to, to try and uh, get, you know, it seems to be unfair competition. You, you know, why is the EU not taking stronger stronger action against Hungary in this sort of thing? Yeah, two, two very good questions. The first one's easy to answer. The second one's much more difficult. Yeah. So I'll concentrate on the first one. No, I'll, I'll do them both. Yeah. Um, so on, on the English language, it will stay the major language of the EU. And the proof of this is the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, where you know, of the entire Eurozone, less than 1% of the population has English as a native language, which is the population of Ireland. But English is the only, it's, it's not one of the working languages, it's the only working language of the European Central Bank, which is based in Frankfurt, where probably more local staffers speak French as a second language rather, rather than German. Is that because it's a world language? Because it's a world language, yeah. Um, there was a, there was a rumour going around that because the UK was leaving, then English would would automatically be withdrawn and everybody would speak Irish instead. I mean, <laughs> you know, th th this policy has been tried elsewhere and didn't really work very well. Um, but uh, I think the, um, 
the, the, you know, the, the, the fact is that no one's interested in, even the French are not interested in pushing French these days. I mean, and my experience falling over in the park in Brussels yesterday just was, was very illustrative to me of, <laughs> of, of, of just how far English has penetrated. Um, now, your question about Viktor Orban. Um, I wish I had a really good answer for this. The fact is the EU is not good at taking action against its own member states. And this is where the difference is between Hungary and the future UK. Um, and one can think of other examples. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, of what's now North Macedonia. I've been working on that issue for many, many years. Greece's attitude to the Macedonian name issue was completely reprehensible, based entirely on domestic considerations with no real... Um, with, with no kind of objective basis uh, for blocking Macedonia from membership in various international bodies purely because they chose to call themselves by the name which they thought was theirs. Now, um, the EU was unable to force Greece to take a stand on this even, and I got this um, during the Greek financial crisis, I got my Macedonian friends saying, oh, this is great, as part of the deal with Greece, they'll force Greece to take a, a better line on us. Said, oh, no, sorry, that's just not the way it works. Uh, same with Cyprus and Turkey, um, where you know, Cyprus and Turkey, there's fault on both sides, but Cyprus has got immensely more le leverage now that it's a member of the European Union. So um, there are ways of raising Orban's behaviour internally within the EU, those ways are being used and he will have to engage in dialogue. This is actually paying some dividends in Poland where there are similar problems and one sees kind of graduated retreat by the Polish government from some of the more extreme positions they've taken, but by no means all. Um, and it's a worrying thing that the EU is going to have to learn to deal with and has not yet worked out how to do. So I don't have an answer except that I'm really worried. <laughs> Thanks, Nicholas. That was that was great. Uh, if I can tell my one translation story uh, at a poverty conference in Brussels, the Irish delegation were arguing for the rights of Irish travellers, uh, and the French translation had it as the rights of Irish tourists. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the the predominance of English is really interesting in the way you've described it over uh, recent times. Um, my question is about the former Soviet Union and the EU, uh, and it picks up on Ben's point as well about what are the implications of the UK's departure for the rest. We've mentioned Orban, Poland, the Italian banks, Greece, uh, and so forth. When the Soviet Union was collapsing, Yeltsin took Russia out before it became the last state standing. Now, when does Merkel say, I'm not funding this forever? And when does Germany say this needs to be either radically reformed or the pressures are too great? Those are two, those are two different questions, Quentin. One is about the relations with the former Soviet Union. One of them is about Germany's future with, with the EU. Um, on the former Soviet Union, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, there's no appetite for enlargement beyond the Balkans. In the, in, the, in the EU at the moment, except possibly Iceland if they were to change their minds, uh, but that's it. And, or, and Norway if they were to change their minds, which I think is also unlikely. Um, however, there's great appetite for European integration from a, a clear majority of the population in Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova, not always reflected in election results because sometimes these things don't get reflected in election results, but public opinion surveys make it quite clear. Less so for Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, for very different reasons in each case. Um, the, uh, the Belarusians are too um, undemocratic, the Azeris are too rich, and the Armenians are too convinced that they're the best country in the world. Um, but uh, so the EU is not going to go very much further into the former Soviet Union. It will maintain its commitments, which include managing the ceasefire lines in both Georgia and Ukraine. Um, which is actually quite a lot, uh, but it, there isn't an appetite for further expansionism. Germany. For Germany, maintaining European integration is a constitutional, national, political imperative. Every German political party, apart from a couple of small ones, the, the AfD being the, the most notable, 
uh, who get a lot of coverage here, even though they're like fourth in the opinion polls. Um, but from, for the, the, the widespread of German political actors and for German public opinion, maintaining the EU is, is key. Um, and of course, part of that bargain is that they remain largely in control, but not completely in control. Um, it's a negotiating process where the Germans will win more often than not, but uh, they also it's in their interests to make sure that everybody feels that they're winning more often than not. Um, particularly with British departure, the EU is going to become more and more reconstructed along French-German lines of agreement. Um, they both have got clear uh, commitments uh, to maintain the EU as matters of national security and pride. Um, and I really can't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, I can see differences of nuance coming in, uh, but uh, you know, reports that any leading German politicians outside the IFD are in any way Eurosceptic are, are very wide of the mark. So uh, the way things are set up, I can't really see that changing. Ooh, everybody. Okay. I'll go to the gentleman here in the middle. Okay. Like, was, is there any hope uh, that the UK might actually stay? With all the evidence that we have, you know, about the money that's been out of the Parliament and investment that's not there, mm -hmm. that they might change their mind. <laughs> I mean, Willie, you know better than I do, It's because you're living here, I'm not. <laughs> but, um, I mean, look, it's, it's, it's a lose-lose situation. There's no universe in which disrupting your, your trading links with your major trading partner is, is actually uh, an economic win. Um, I, I find it difficult to add up the political arithmetic that leads to a situation where a British Prime Minister either revokes Article 50 before October or asks to come back anytime soon. But I would have thought in the long term, it just, you know, it, it appears to make historical sense to me. Um, so I don't know whether it'll be another 40 years as it was since the 1975 referendum, but I, I wouldn't be astonished. If, I, I rather hope it's in my lifetime and yours. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, questions? Uh, maybe in the, uh, mm -hmm. Can you I, I'm not a journalist or an academic or anything. I'm just your ordinary punter. Mm -hmm. But I did vote to remain for all the reasons that um, Jane has mentioned and how much Northern Ireland has benefited from being within the, U the EU, not least to allow us a third identity, which is helpful in our sectarianized society. But I, 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 I do have arguments with friends, and I'll, I'll be going out now um, with Jane supporting um, her campaign and, and people will say to us but if you have special arrangements for Northern Ireland the backstop or, or whatever it is special status that is going to threaten the Union okay that has been the big one every um, Brexit supporting newspaper in Northern Ireland that's the big one the Union doesn't matter if we've economic ruin the Union is what matters and I know I might be asking you a very difficult question, but would some kind of special arrangement for Northern Ireland threaten the Union? I personally can't see it. I, I cannot see it. I, I see a customs arrangement, some kind of um, five-year, ten-year structure to protect us. But that is what people are saying. That mantra of the threat to the Union has really become the main narrative uh, for uh, rejecting our involvement in the EU. So I would be very interested. I really enjoyed what you were saying. I've learned a lot from it. But I wondered if you could give an opinion anyway. I'm not asking you to be a prophet. <laughs> give an opinion. Cheers. Um, look, I think that um, you are very rightly concerned about facts. Not everybody is in this debate. And the fact is that there are a lot of creative solutions found around the borders of the EU for areas that are requiring special treatment one way or the other. I mentioned a couple of them earlier on. Um, and where there is a will, there is a way. Um, it should also be said that, uh, you know, um, special arrangements for agricultural products between here and England, Scotland and Wales, that's actually something that's already in place in some cases. And I think the, the question is whether we apply to 
I can't remember which way around it, it is, do we now apply to dead cattle the same issues that we apply to live cattle, or maybe it's the other way around. So, um, you know, really weird little trading arrangements that affect a, a fairly small, um, well, that, that affect a, an important part of the business sector. Is that sovereignty? Surely sovereignty is who you vote for and who makes your laws. Um, and to me, unless there's an actual serious change on that point, I don't, I don't buy the sovereignty argument myself, but I know that many people do. Yes, that's very powerful. Thank you. Gentlemen, there are the Brandt. Sorry, uh, Mervyn McCain. Uh, just a question maybe on the same vein. Does the EEC really take the UK government's um, interest in Northern Ireland seriously? Straight question, straight, straight answer. Question. I mean, straight answer, yes. I mean, you know, the, the EU's interest is in the border, right, rather than Northern Ireland. The EU's interest, I mean, the EU has an interest in Northern Ireland as well. The, the, the story here is seen as being one that the EU contributed to. Um, but it's recognised that this is UK territory and is going to remain UK territory until there's a vote to change that. So that's the level of the EU's acceptance of it. The issue is manage management of the border and how you can have an open border while also respecting all the things that need to be respected about trade regulations and security. Um, and that's an issue the EU has actually dealt with elsewhere as well. Uh, which is why the solutions that have been proposed have been proposed. But in terms of does the EU accept that the UK has an interest in Northern Ireland, yes it does. Now, I would put it back to you. I would say is London really interested in Northern Ireland because I'm not sure that that's the case. <laughs> and um, I, I would just say two words to you on that. Uh, Karen Bradley. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, I'm interested in the, the Brussels view on the resignation of Sir Ivan Rogers and when and when he resigned. Also, I'm interested in because um, we get the British press's view, not necessarily the Brussels view, on Cox, on, on the Attorney General, uh, on his visit to uh, the Brussels, uh, and also in Rab and uh, the Brexit. Minister after David Davis on his engagement, he seemed to have a slightly different type of engagement. So those three things interest me in terms of the Brussels view. The other thing that interests me is that um, it's likely that Farage will be returned as the largest, you know, kind of MEP party from the UK, and you kind of wonder how that will go down in Brussels. Um, uh, and finally. The Institute of Government have done a timeline to the end of October and essentially we've almost run out of time already because of the recesses and perda with elections, etc, etc. So if at the end of October we're at the position where we are today, what will the view be in Brussels? Right, that's five questions. I'm going to try and, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to try and take them in reverse order, OK? Because that's the... Uh, first of all, Institute of Government do great stuff, believe everything they say, I'm not going to criticise it or add to it. I think that um, if we're still where we are now at the, on the 31st of October, and if the UK then asks for an extension, the EU will grudgingly grant it. Um, but I hope we're not there, but I agree that it's, it's, it's not at all unlikely. Um, Nigel Farage has made almost no impact in the European Parliament other than making silly speeches every now and then and uh, creating good te television moments. That's all he wants to do, which is fair enough. Um, but the fact is that if you have 20 out of 73 British MEPs who are not actually doing anything very much, it means that the country as a whole punches below its weight in the European Parliament. If it's 30 out of 70 rather than 20 out of 70, then it means Britain matters even less in the next Parliament than it did in this one. Um, three personalities were a reverse order, Rab, Cox and Rogers. So Rab first, nobody noticed. I mean, he was, uh, by the time he was appointed Brexit secretary, the control in London had been shifted very firmly to the cabinet office. Um, he clearly wasn't actually, I, I mean, he clearly had not actually read his own briefing points and did not know what he was negotiating. Um, 
Well, precisely, and uh, and therefore he was not um, he, he was never taken seriously in Brussels because he was not actually ever there. Um, Cox, on the other hand, appeared out of nowhere, having never. And again, it was a bit weird that somebody who'd done nothing on the negotiations so far then turns up at the last moment asking for for new deals and coming up with quite extraordinary arguments. Um, so he was taken seriously when he arrived, but not by the time he left. Um, Ivan Rogers is taken very seriously, and I do recommend all of the stuff that he's been writing since his resignation. Um, I wouldn't say he was, a, I mean, you know, he was a known factor within Brussels because he'd been, um, not everyone knew this, but I did because I knew a couple of his colleagues. He was um, Leon Britton's chief of staff when Leon Britton was the European Commissioner, which is going back 20 years now. Um, so he, he knew the Brussels machinery quite well, and of course he's a, he's a very good analyst. Um, however, as British permanent representative, most of that analysis was being funneled back to London, where it was being ignored, which was why he resigned. Um, so it's, it's only now that he's really coming into his own as a, as a Brussels personality and starting to appear at conferences and that kind of thing. Um, and he does good conferences. Um, so uh, um, this should be another point perhaps for Slugger or indeed for, for Chris to kind of see if you can get him over here. I think he would be, uh, I think he'd be very entertained and willing to speak. <coughs> so I think that's, that's the action point from that question. Get Ivan Rogers to speak here next. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, Okay. Well, I, I have to declare I voted leave in 2016, and I'd vote leave again, which puts me probably in a minority of one in this room, which maybe is part of the kind of the problem of the whole debate. People very going to the certain, staying in their own bubbles and not really reaching out. But that's that's the side. I want to go back to what you said, and I think you were talking your opinion, not quoting about the euro. You suggested that not calling a referendum on the euro, which probably would have failed, in my opinion, but that's, that's, that's not the point. Um, was, was one of the key drivers of your scepticism in, in this country. Um, and, and you suggested two things, or well, you made two points. Firstly, that we could have made it less German, could have made the Euro zone less German. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? I, 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 need, I need detail on that. And secondly, um, you, you suggested that we would have had influence. I, I disagree. We, we've, been in the, we've had a lot of Europhile prime ministers up to 2010. The majority of our MEPs were Euro, pro-EU. Not, not your skeptic, and we weren't able to put uh, much influence on services. Two, mid two thousands, we tried to change. We tried to bring a single market of services, and we basically failed. The, the, the ultimate le legislation was meaningless. So, can you? Re is, is it really credible to say we would have had an effect that would have been beneficial to us when on that issue and all that time? This is long. This is before UKIP got really big and before the BNP got big. Um, c c is, is it really credible to say you would have had an influence that would have been beneficial to us? Okay, your second question is much easier than the first. Um, so again, I'll do it first. Um, British influence, it, you know, it's, it's always difficult when you have a complex Grand Coalition Committee style decision to say this was a British initiative which was picked up and run with. Um, but, I mean, the single market itself was actually a British initiative, and that was the. Uh, this was Margaret Thatcher and Lord Cofield back in the 1980s, uh, who who essentially broke down all the regulatory barriers and created the, the single market for the for what was then the EU12. Um, so the the fact that that's there itself to me is a sign of British influence. Britain also maintains, an, I mean, yeah, the the failure of the services directive is is embarrassing and um, unfortunate and. Uh, Britain was not alone in backing it, but uh, there were obviously some vested interests that were, that were opposing it. One can only go so far. Britain also was actually quite significantly influential on various security issues, particularly the Balkans in the 1999-2000 um, in the, in the period, and even now to a certain extent. Um, and that's just the area that I follow most closely myself. However, it is, a, it is fair to say the British influence started to wane as Euroscepticism increased. And I had a conversation about four years ago with the permanent representative of one of the countries that's generally seen as close to the UK in the EU. And I said to him, your country is generally seen as close to the, close to the British. How does this work out for you in practice? He said, yeah, you know, everyone says that. And the British keep on coming to me with this or that initiative and they want, they want me to sign off on it. 
um, so that we'll be you know, supporting them. And my instructions from my capital are very clear. My response should be, in, in all cases, what do the Germans think? Which leads me back to your first question, which is um, how could the euro have been made less German? I'm not an expert on this. I'm really not. Um, the, the fact is it's a collective mechanism. The fact is that the strongest voices will carry the most influence. Britain, because of the city, would have had a, would have had a stronger voice. It just seems to me, therefore, inevitable. The essay by Chris Hume that I referred to, um, What If Britain Had Joined the Euro, it's in, a, um, it's in a collection of essays, which I think is called Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister and Other Things That Never Happened, um, by, uh, edited by Duncan Brack. Um, and it's got a, which includes also, ironically, an essay about what would have happened if Chris Hewn had been elected Lib Dem leader instead of Nick Clegg um, by, by Duncan Brack. No, by Mark Pack, sorry. Uh, so I recommend that to you, uh, but I'm not enough of an, of, of an economics geek to go into full details, I'm afraid. Okay. I'm going to go down to the front here, Frank. Uh, and I'll go down to the front here, Frank. Uh, Brian, that, that's yeah. oh, Poor gentleman, the pink shirt has been waiting for ages. Yeah, Hello. Thank you. Um, what uh, positives do you see coming out of Brexit? Oh, that's easy. None. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there, aren't, there aren't any. There aren't any. Really, there aren't. No, sorry, just maybe to expand on that, uh, not to be too frivolous, but um, really, some, last time I gave a talk on Brexit, somebody asked me exactly the same question, and I waffled for five minutes before I realised that the answer was pretty much none. Um, you know, the UK having its own trade policy, fine, but what's it going to do with that uh, wonderful trade with, uh, with Australia and New Zealand, uh, which are not actually that close to this country, or um, the United States, because they're so reliable right now. Um, no, I just don't see it. Sorry. Nick, Nick, could you not make the case that the people in power, or the establishment in the UK, it kind of suits them? Because they're, you're going to have the situation of less regulation, yes. you know, Britain yeah. becoming more offshore. So the oh, yeah. nerves are going to get probably incredibly rich out of Brexit. You know, so, but uh, then you're basically asking me, do I think that the rich getting richer is a positive outcome? And my answer is not. No. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but for the people who make the decisions, it's a positive outcome for them, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I who's there's also a movement that organisations that are politically engaged. Am I allowed to make a point? Yes. Yeah. Could be. Could be. I'm out. Sorry. <laughs> Mike Coyle, I'd like to make a point. I'd like to take up on Ben's uh, issue about the size of the economy. I saw a credible report the other day, and I can't get remember the source. Uh, but as the fifth great biggest economy, uh, the forecast was that. Uh, within the next 10 years, outside the EU, Britain will become 10th or 11th or perhaps disappear from the, the economies. Now, I was in Germany a couple of weeks ago at the Hanover Fair. It's one of the biggest industrial fairs in the whole of the EU and shapes quite a lot of the economy, you know. Now, it's very interesting that that fair was started in 1947 under British military uh, engagement, British military governance in northern Germany. It has grown into one of the biggest industrial fairs in Europe. And at that fair, at the beginning of this month, the uh, international participation was incredible. China, India, uh, I, I, I can't, but part in particular Russia. Now, this is, I, I'm fighting with this relationship with Russia, as we see it somewhat different in this part of the world to what the Germans see. And I think we've we got, we got to start dealing with that. We've got to start dealing with something else in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland was a basket case. We had sewerage problems, with which the EU helped enormously, and they're very proud of themselves, and we're very thankful to them. But we're in a new situation now. We're in a new, we're in a new global economy where we have to take our part Within, within, within the global economy, and I suggest we, would, we do that better, like Germany, through the EU and through the mechanisms of the EU. Because that gives us 500 million people as against the Chinese billion, as against the Indian billion, as against the growth in Africa, as against the threat from Russia, as against the migration, the, uh, the attempt or the need to build Africa into a country or a place where people are not migrating towards shores of, of Europe. Uh, sorry for, for all that, that stuff. 
Uh, there was a question at the end of it, and I can't even find it now. Oh yes, the the question really That's was the, the question why? really was: Do you think that if we had focused more at, at the moment, all the the, the backstop has taken our total dis all the discussion? I mean, there are two key key issues in the future thing. One of them is security, and the other is the economy. They're very broad, big, big topics. But do you think that in our region? If we'd focused more on this discussion of the future, we might have come to more con constructive relationships because Europe is going to have to change over the next years as well as Britain. Sorry, I'll leave it yeah. at that. Yeah. Thank you. And the fundamental question is if, if Northern Ireland looked more at the future than the past, would we be a better place? I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just leave that there. But, 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 well, exactly, and the, the replacement of shorts and everything. I, I want to pick up on a point that you, you touched on, which was the, the global economy. I don't think Britain will fall as low as 10th or off the table in the next, uh, in the next 10 or 20 years. It's still fairly big, but the, but the economic balance of the world is changing. And I had the weird experience in July of um, attending the, the annual summit between China and the 15 Eastern European countries. And this is done at prime ministerial level. And I was there supporting the Bulgarian government declaration. I was working for the Bulgarians at the time. And um, the Chinese prime minister came and he made his speech, which was generally full of the, everything you would expect. And there was one phrase that really took my breath away. And I could hear a sharp intake of breath all around the room as it came through the, the translation phones. Uh, prime Minister Xi said, China is in favour of European integration. Wow. I wasn't expecting that. Um, leaping to another part of the world, my friend who's the African foreign minister, his country's population has increased by five times since 1950. His country's economy has increased by 25 times. Uh, you know, ballpark figures. Um, uh, he's from one of the smaller countries of Africa, so he's not going to be challenging Britain for top spot anytime soon. But you've got Nigeria, you've got uh, South Africa, you've got Ethiopia. No one ever talks about Ethiopia. Population of 80 million people, they all speak English as well as Amharic, and they were never even in the British Empire. You know, watch out for the Ethiopians. They're, they're coming, in a good way. Um, yeah, well, indeed. Uh, so uh, I, I think, um, and there is, as you rightly say, the Russian threat, but that is being eroded by, by their own economic situation. So, I mean, it, it's bad in the short term, but in the medium term, I think it evolves into something else. Um, so, yeah, the, these are all good points, and um, it basically comes down to being more aware of the world around us and how it's changing. Thanks for a fascinating uh, talk. It's been a great conversation. Um, I had one question, and it's, and it's a selfish question because it's, it's close to my heart and what I do with my own work, and that's a lot of work around anti-corruption and the UK's role as being a central money laundering hub, um, a place where the banking sector has been complicit in a lot of extremely serious illicit activity um, that has impacted on the rest of Europe and uh, the former Soviet Union and further abroad. Um, we, the UK has a legal infrastructure that is used by uh, money launderers, organized crime and various other nefarious individuals and kleptocrats. And, you know, what's the view about how this may impact on that side of things? Because, of course, we've seen at one stage David Cameron came forward and, and presented the UK at the 2016 Anti-Corruption Summit as being the leader in trying to bring around good governance and transparency. Um, and, you know, one of the potential trajectories one would anticipate could be that um, when times um, get tough, they'll lean towards a finance curse that's been discussed by the Tax Justice Network about the, dis the negative impact, the net impact the finance industry is having on the UK economy. And we'll turn to um, the, the, the um, sort of black economy, so to speak. Uh, is that something that you think is a, a, a realistic concern to have? The growth of organised crime and corruption is, is a huge issue for the EU and for everybody. We are seeing a recalibration in how this is being tackled. Um, the EU made a power grab in the process just earlier this year um, by drawing up its own blacklist of suspect jurisdictions 
or at least the, the European Commission did, I should say. Um, and th this list went further than the um, what is called the FATF uh, group, which is the, the major international organ, uh, which is kind of rooted in the OECD in Paris, which is which has previously had had the lead in in um, on, on corruption. The um, interestingly, the Commission was felt to have overreached its mandate by both Parliament and the member states. And I think twenty six out of twenty seven. Actually, 27 out of 28 member states rejected the Commission's blacklist of, uh, of corrupt jurisdictions, um, which is worrying because I think they all probably had a case to answer. <laughs> um, uh, we're not getting better at this, I don't think. And uh, for all the UK's pretensions, the fact is that the UK also supervises some jurisdictions which are themselves rather dodgy. I won't name names, but you know who I'm talking about. Um, and uh, there, is, there is strong scope for improvement. Um, at the same time, we are seeing the growth of the information age making it not only more easy to transfer money in a dodgy way, but also more easy to expose people when they've done it. And one of my favourite moments from about two years ago, Moldova, lovely country, recommend it. Um, uh, you know, a, a terrible thing happened in Moldova. Um, there was a massive bank fraud, which was the result of money laundering. And literally, one eighth of the entire money supply of the country was stolen. I mean, this puts the Northern Bank into some perspective. And um, the outgoing Prime Minister was caught on tape discussing how he was going to novel the judges. So I'm glad to say he's now in jail. And we are seeing increasingly you know, moves against public officials who abuse that position. In Eastern Europe, we haven't seen all that much of it in Western Europe, and I suspect there may be a story to tell. It's not Brexit related, but it's still a story to tell. But will Brexit make things worse? Possibly. Um, I think the jury's out. Any final question? <coughs> Let me ask one more. Uh, has Brexit? Uh, no, been the biggest failure in British diplomacy since the Suez? Has Brexit been the biggest failure of British diplomacy since the Suez Crisis? Hmm. And the difficulty there, Willie, is deciding whether or not the Suez Crisis was actually worse. Um, probably since the Second World War, I'd say. Yeah. I think it's actually worse than the Suez Crisis. Because the Suez Crisis, in the end, was only about control of a particular relatively small strip of territory, although symbolically it was very, very important. But the practical impact was, was almost zero on, on jobs and on the economy. Um, and it also provided the, 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 the way of getting rid of a, a prime minister who we now know was a drug addict. So, you know, that's a, that's all, that, that was all fine. But um, Brexit's going to be much more serious in its, uh, ongoing, um, in its ongoing effects. And smarter diplomacy could have mitigated that, I think, in a way that... Um, in a way that uh, possibly isn't so much the case for Suez. So. Okay, I'm being directed by Alan to go behind the podium to do the uh, thank yous. Um, first off, can I just thank the School of um, Applied Social and Policy Sciences for partnering with us uh, tonight. So led by Professor Chris Lazard at the back there. So Chris, thank you so very much for... And also a massive thanks to Dr. Nicholas White for a fascinating um, uh, presentation and fascinating uh, answer. Thank you so much. And a big thank you also to you for coming out and having so many fantastic questions and for really engaging. So from all of us, thank you so very much. And again, thank you to Nicholas White. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.